morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. All right, welcome to Sabbath School. And as always, I'll be Reverend Daniel for prayer. Amen. We've been going over the things that the Lord has been sharing with us. And last week in our prophecy seminar, one of the things the Lord really um, caused us to see mostly is the transition. The transition from one government to another government, which is crowned with the inauguration of, of a king. And the Lord gave us a view of that by showing us in the natural this transition from President Trump to President Biden, and he showed us that there was an election, there was a certification, and it ended with this inauguration. And so um, we'll continue looking along those lines, particularly today, I'll try to basically um, focus uh, on this sign. Why, why do we have sign here? What does it mean? How do we understand this to be that sign? And so, um, let us begin by going into our notes. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to get to the end of my notes. It's about 13 pages, so we'll do as much as we can. And um, I encourage participation as, 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 as thoughts come that we can share and discuss with one another. So in Acts of the Apostles, 38, paragraph 3, Sister White says, The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's what? heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he, sent, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a what? As a token. What is another word for token? Sign. sign. So the, the receiving of uh, the rain is a sign that Christ's inauguration is complete. All right? So he ties the sign to the inauguration. No, token is a sign. Well, yes, the, the, the Holy Spirit was a gift, right? So, yes, you could give someone a token, a sign, right? Something to remember them by, right? A memorial, amen. So it says, um, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had as what? As priest and, and king received what? All authority in heaven and on earth, and was anointed one over all, over his people. Now, Christ was anointed priest and what? King. king. But we know in the natural there is there is a priestly work followed by a kingly work. So he was in, inaugurated to be priest, but he also has to be inaugurated to be to be king, right? All right. So um, next quote. Uh, MS 52, 1890, paragraph 3. So, as I'm understanding, this sign is parallel with this inauguration. Amen? All right, we'll see that as we go along. It says, I felt most intensely on, upon some points, especially the inauguration of Christ, where? On the banks of Jordan, Jordan she says, to his appointed work. So, so, on the banks of Jordan, what work was he appointed to? The work of priest. Right? So, at, on the banks of Jordan, he was inaugurated as priest. There is a work that he has to do. So, it says, The dedication of, of Christ was not to be mingled with any human agency. What an event was this. Christ entering upon his work with the seal of divinity upon him. The baptismal scene... At the hand of John was followed by Jesus walking out of the water and offering his prayer to his father. The heavens were open 
and the spirit descended upon him, assuming the form of a dove, in appearance like burnished gold. And the voice of the Father was heard in recognition of the offering of Christ to God. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, in the line of um, Moses, we know this is the birth of Moses. Sorry, Christ, the line of Christ. Right? We know this is the birth of Christ. Followed by John in the wilderness. Followed by what? His baptism. Right? And now the Lord is, is teaching us that is the baptism one point? No. no, the Lord is teaching us that these things is a period of time. There is a beginning and there is an end. So when you come to the baptism, right at the end, there is a beginning and there is an, there is an end. So this whole period here would have to be the, the baptism. Everybody's following? All right. So now you come down to the end and now it's the baptism. And right there, it says the heavens were opened, right? And these are things we put in the record, already. Right? We know, like, the heavens are open at the beginning. Amen? Amen? All right. So, I mean, the whole thing is the opening of the heavens. But let me just, so that we know it begins here, you have the heavens open. Let's go on to the next quote. Uh, to, to the next paragraph. This was only a faint representation of that which was enacted in heaven. So while Christ was being baptized on earth, there was something happening where? And this is why we get the view of it. That's why the heavens open. So we can see it. Right? It's the lifting of the veil, so to speak. If the curtain could be rolled back and mortal eyes be strengthened, and mortal eyes strengthen to behold within the gates the scenes taking place there, they would see all the angels and archangels, all thrones and dominions, and principalities and powers in heaven, standing in awe and reverence, beholding the work in heaven, and it's what? Counterpart. That word counterpart is, is a copy. Right? It means it's copy. Right? It says hold in, And it's counterpart in faint lines taking place upon the earth and one example of that is the sanctuary right make me the sanctuary after the what after the pattern so Moses made a a copy so it was only to demonstrate what was taking place in in heaven so this baptism was only what on earth was a copy right when we are baptized in Christ it's only a copy of what's taking place in in heaven there is a work that is accompanied with your you will all work here on earth. So, continuing on. It says, The Lord God of heaven was never more highly exalted before the universe than on this occasion. And I bolded the word never because you're going to see it a few times. Right? Right here, the Lord is showing us that when you come to the fifth day of the fourth month, He's doing something that we have never seen before. But have we seen it before? Yes. In principles. Yeah. Right? It's a new thing to, 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 to us on earth in the way it's happening. But principally, right, amen. Principally, we, we could go into the stories and find them and bring them to a time to try to understand exactly what Christ is doing. Right? So, it says, The worlds which had not fallen, beheld and admired and adored. Sorry, beh yes. The worlds which had not fallen, beheld and admired and adored. For never had the love of God been so expressed on this occasion, when his love was found so deep and rich and broad, that it, would, that it gave up to the world his only begotten Son to the great work of bringing the character of God before the world, that men might behold it in him. Never had been so great rejoicing as when what? The tabernacle of heaven was set up among men. So she ties Christ's baptism to what? To the setting up of the tabernacle. Right? So at, at, when you come to this point, which is the baptism, um, like Romario says, it's connected to Revelation 21. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. But where does that happen? Where is that fulfilled, Revelation 21? At the end. 
right? But when you come to the baptism, what is she, what, what is she say, saying is there? It's a type, right? It's a token. It's a sign, right, that the end is near. You following? So the baptism of Christ typifies this tabernacle that comes down at the end. All right, so let's look at this baptism, baptismal scene. Uh, because that's where she points us. She points us to this baptismal scene. <laughs> no, I'm saying, yeah, the true, the true, the true tabernacle, right? The holy city comes down at the end, right? No. Uh, Mark chapter one, verses nine to three. It says, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth. Of, of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan, which is what we just showed here on the boat. It says, And straightway coming up of the, out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit uh, like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art, my beloved, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him where? into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. So for 40 days, immediately, Christ goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, he was what? Tempted of Satan, right? And I'm not saying he wasn't tempted through the 40 days, but we know that there's three temptations that he meets at the, at, at the end of the 40 days. Amen? So this 40 days ends right here at the midnight cry. And you have these three temptations that he, that he goes through. All right. Um, these are of ages. 111, paragraph 6. Christ has been baptized and he's coming up out of the water. And Sister White says, The Savior's glance seemed to penetrate heaven as he pours out his soul in, in prayer. Well, he knows how sin has hardened the hearts of men, and how difficult it will be for them to discern his mission and accept the gift of salvation. He pleads with the Father for power to overcome their unbelief, to break the feathers with fetters, amen, with which Satan has enthralled them, and in their behalf to conquer the destroyer. He asks for the what? For the witness that God accepts humanity in the person of his son. Amen. And I skipped I skip one thing earlier, just, just so that we know. The word enacted means passed into law, just so we understand that. So when Christ was baptized, there was a law in heaven made. That is the point that, that, a point that we must um, understand. So, um, so now, in this quote that we just read, it says, after, he, when he was baptized, he came out of the water. What did he do? He poured his soul out in prayer. So this 10 here, this last portion, this midway from the 9th to the 9th, as we, as, which helps us to find it. But this portion here, it's marking the baptism of Christ. And it says he comes out of the water and the heavens open. open. And we know that this is parallel to the fifth day of the fourth month. So when we take this period here and we open it like the Lord has taught us, we come to the beginning here at the, right here at the fifth day of the fourth month. This is where he's coming out of the water. We follow him? And what does he do? Man, he prays, right? Amen? So, from this, it's lots of prayer. Right there at the fifth day of the fourth month. And it says the heavens open. When you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, what was Ezekiel doing? The Bible says he was mourning. Right? He was sighing and crying for the abominations done in the land. He was praying. And then what happened? The heavens? Open. The heavens open. Right? Second witness showing that when you pray there, the heavens open. So um, the Bible says he prayed for power and he prayed for what, Rashad? A sign. You've said it, right? A witness. Right? So this word witness. If you go down, it means that which furnishes evidence or proof, right? So, from this point onwards, from the fifth day of the fourth month, our prayer is for what? For proof. Proof of what? Proof of the light that came here. Because Christ was the light that came at the baptism. 
and he was praying for proof so that all men will see that he was that light. Right? So when we got the light at the fifth day of the fourth month, the prediction, we should be praying for, for proof of that light. Right? But there is a work that we have to do as well. Christ did not go to the baptism. Right? He came there at the appointed time. Therefore, the light that we receive, we should be moving in accordance with that light so that at the appointed time, God can send proof, the sign, right, that this is, this is his people, this is his beloved son. All right, next, um, continuing on, 112 paragraph 1. It says, never before have angels listened to what? Prayer. Our prayer then should be different. Since we receive the light and our prayer should be based on that light. Amen? They, were, they are eager to bear to their love commander a message of assurance and comfort. But no, the Father himself will answer the petition of his Son. Direct from the throne issue beams of glory. The heavens are open, and upon the Savior's head descends a dove-like form of purest light, a fit emblem of him, the meek and lowly one. Now on the largest level we have here, we pray from the fifth day of the fourth month and we receive this light at the end, at midway, right? So this is at midway, you have the symbol of the dove, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. So let us go on to the next quote. It says, of the vast throng at, at the Jordan, few except who? John discerned the, the heavenly vision. Yet, the solemnity of the divine presence rested upon the assembly. The people stood silently gazing upon Christ. His form was bathed in the light that ever surrounds the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had what? Never before seen the face of man. From the heavens, from the open heavens, was heard a voice saying, "This is my, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased." And on the largest level, we become a son at midway, All right, at midnight. All right. So let's add now another um, story on the top of that which we just read. In Genesis chapter twenty-two, the Bible says, "And it came to pass after these things that God did what." tempt Abraham, right? So who comes down there? The tempter, right? And no, uh, we know it says God, but we, we understand that God allows Satan to come down and tempt Abraham. And um, it says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I Tell thee off. And Abraham rose, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Now we know that this is Abraham's final test, right? And the final test of the people of God begins where? At the midnight cry. Yes, Ramari. So, um, the final test is at the midnight cry, right? And just like Christ was tempted, so too Abraham is, is tempted, right? Continuing on. Let's read the quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. She says, Satan was at hand to suggest that he must be what? There is Satan with his temptations, right? If thou be the son of God, right? Amen. Turn this stone into bread. This is him telling Abraham, well, psh, God, God wouldn't do that, right? God wouldn't say you're his son. It says, Satan was at hand to suggest that he must be deceived, for the divine law commands, thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill. And God would not require what he had once forbidden. Going outside his tent, Abraham looked up to the calm brightness of the unclouded heavens and recalled the promise made nearly 50 years before that his seed should be innumerable as the stars. If this promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac, 
how could he be put to death? Abraham was tempted to believe that he might be under a delusion. In his doubt and anguish, he bowed upon the earth and did what? Pray like he had never prayed before. Never prayed before. All right, so at, at the midnight cry in type, you pray like you've never prayed before. Now, when we bring another line on here, this parallels 2016, amen? amen? And so in 2016, from 2016, we should have been praying like we've never prayed before. All right? It says, for some confirmation of the command, if he must perform this terrible duty. He remembered the angels sent to reveal to him God's purpose to destroy Sodom. Where, where did the angels come? Where we mark them coming? They came at the beginning, right? So he's at this point, but he's remembering when the light that came at the beginning, right? He's remembering the light of the destruction of Sodom. It says, um, and, bore, and bore to him the promise of this same son Isaac, and went to the place where he had several times met the heavenly messengers, hoping to meet them again, and receive some further direction, but none came to his... He's trod in the wine press alone. This is his cross experience, just like Christ. Right? Darkness seemed to shut him in. And, and we know it's darkness first upon the land and then on, on Christ himself. Right? It says, Darkness seemed to shut him in. But the command of God was sounding in his ears. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, whom thou lovest. That command must be obeyed, and he dared not what? Delay. Day was approaching, and he must be on his journey. So right here, he received this command at, at the midnight cry, and the Bible says he must be on his journey. All right? So there's a journey that begins right here to, uh, at the midnight cry taking you to this mountain. Amen? All right. Next quote, Patriots and Prophets 151, paragraph 1. She said, That day, the longest that Abraham ever experienced, dragged slowly to his close. While his son and the young men were sleeping, he spent the night where? Where else do we see that? Gethsemane. Yeah. While Peter and him were sleeping, what was Christ doing? Morning. Praying, right? So she says, that day he spent in prayer. Day one, he spent in, in prayer. Job down to the next bowl. Another long day, another night of humiliation and prayer. What does he do for day two? Pray. He prays. And we already indicated that when you come to the fifth day of the fourth month, what, do you, what, did, what did Christ do? When he comes up at the baptism. Man, he bowed down and he, he prayed. So for day three, it's what? More prayer. Do we see what the Lord is, is, is impressing upon us? The Lord is impressing upon us prayer. Right? So it says, go down to the next bowl. Satan was near to whisper doubts and unbelief to, to Abraham, an unbelief. But Abraham did what? This is our call, right? Christ says, Father, if this, if, if this cup would pass from me, but yet nevertheless, not my will, but, but thine, right? This is, this is going to be our prayer. This should be our prayer, right? Not our will, but the will of Christ. It says, as they were about to journey on which day? On the third day, the patriarch, looking where? Northward. Northward, saw the promised sign. A cloud of glory hovering over where? Mount Moriah. And he knew that the voice which had spoken to him was from heaven. So on the third day, he saw what? He saw the promised sign, which was the? The cloud, right? So when you get to the third day, and I'm... I'm, I'm saying that the third day takes us to the fifth day of the fourth month, right? 
says he saw this cloud. And we know that the cloud covers the whole thing. Because Christ on the cross was covered by what? Right? It was the ninth to the, to the ninth hour. This cloud was for Christ alone. Amen? All right. So, taking this illustration also and bringing it down to the, to the uh, opening it up, bringing it down to this fifth day of the fourth month to midway, right? We could see that this and that is the same, uh, it's the same parallel, right? And when Abraham comes to the third day, which is the fifth day of the fourth month, he sees the, he sees the cloud, right? The Lord gives him this sign. So this whole thing is the cloud, right? On, it happens under the cloud, right? We know there is great light because the Lord hides where? In the cloud. He makes darkness his, his pavilion, right? So we just have to, by faith, know that all the light is there. Amen? All right. So it says he looked northward. Go ahead. Hmm. If we, even though we don't see the light, the sun is on the other side of the planet, right? There is, uh, we always need to know where the light is, right? So, now let's go to verse 4 of Genesis chapter 22. It says, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place where? So, yes, this whole thing is the cloud, right? But when he gets to the beginning, where did he look? He looked afar off, right? So the cloud, the beginning, was showing him what? At the beginning, he was seeing the, the end, right? So this afar off takes you down to the end. So keep that in mind, all right? Then it says, And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go Yonder, right? So they, then they now have to take a journey from here and going on, onwards, yonder, right? So there is still a, a journey. The Lord is helping us to open this up to see these various points. It says, um, And I will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood for the, of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the, and the knife. And they went, both of them, together. Now, before I continue, while we know the end is midway, which is where Abraham is looking, I'm also going to put it to us that he's also seeing this way mark, where we have the sign. Are we following? While Abraham is seeing the end, right, he's also seeing this sign, because what does this sign is teaching about? It's also teaching you about the end, right? So, I'm going to lay the story of Abraham in this first half, showing this sign only typifies what happens there at, at the end. So, this, this afar off takes us to this sign, because what did he see? A sign, the cloud. Amen? All right. And I'll, I'll further bring in more evidence in, in shortly. Verse 7. And Isaac spoke unto his father, Unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the what? Where is the lamb for the? All right. So Isaac, um, Abraham represents the father, and Isaac is? is Christ, the son. But when you come down one level, who is the father? Christ, and who is the son? You and I. So what is our question? Where is the lamb for the, for the burnt offering? Christ is taking us to this sign, but what can't we see? We can't see everything, right? We can't see the outcome just yet. But what, what, what did Isaac do? He trusted in the word of his, of his father, right? So, so while we do not see everything, we still have to trust in that which the Lord had already revealed. Because Isaac trusted, Ellen White says, because of the way he was brought up, he was brought up to be submissive. And even though he didn't see the end totally, right, he still submitted to the will of his father. All right. So it says, And Abraham said, My son, 
God will what? God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. That's the answer that came back to Isaac. And this is the answer that the Lord is giving us now. While we do not understand all things about what's happening at the end, we know that God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. He will provide the evidence. Right? Amen. It says, so they both, so they went both of them together. Verse 9. And they came to the place where God had told them of. And Abraham did what? Built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Right? Now I'm suggesting right here is the place. This 10, right before the sign. This is the place where the Lord sent them. Right? Because this sign is the cloud that he saw. Okay? Continue now. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham did what? Lifted up his eyes, right? And I know we didn't talk about that, but on the third day, it said he lifted up his eyes, right? At the beginning of the third day, he lifted up his eyes. And now he comes to the end where, he sacrificed, where he's about to sacrifice his son, and what does he do? He lifted up his eyes, because God tells the end from the... He lifted up his eyes, which only... This is only typifying what's going to happen at Midway, right? The Bible said, um, look up for your redemption, joy. Now nah, you lift up your eyes, right? So, it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt sacrifice in the stead of his son, right? Now, I do... In light of this, I, I'm do, I do believe that whatever is coming in this period for us is going to be grave, right? But God is going to do what? Based on this text. He's going to provide a ram to take our place, right? Did Isaac, in the, in the story, I, did Isaac die here? No, he didn't, right? Because, because Isaac was only pointing to to, to Christ at the end, right? So this sign, we're going to see the same events leading up to that point, but it's not going to happen. The Lord is going to stop it and provide himself a, a lamb, a sacrifice, a ransom, which is down there at the end. Are we following? All right. It says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, and it was said unto this day, and as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Praise God. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in what? In blessing thee I will, in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. Sorry, multiply thy seeds as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the sea which is upon the sea, sure. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his... What is he promising him? He's promising him full dominion. Right? He's promising him this land. And he says, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast what? Obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose, they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So, right here at this sign, the Lord is going to, in this period here, the Lord is going to call us to make a sacrifice. Right? And as we, we are found faithful, if we're found faithful, the Lord is going to make with us a covenant that we're going to receive the, the land at the end. Right? So, let us go to John chapter 1, back to the baptismal scene. Verse 23, 28, sorry, to 31. 
It says, these things were done, done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the... Right here. So at the baptism, when John sees Jesus, he says what? Behold the... What does he say, Michelle? Behold the Lamb. All right? For space, I can't write the whole thing. Behold the Lamb. Right there at this baptism. It says, This is he of whom I, I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, that he should be made manifest to Israel, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with so John is here baptizing with water. water. Next quote. These are of ages 112, paragraph 5. None among the hearers, and not even the speaker himself, discern the import of these words, the Lamb of God. Upon Mount what? So what she ties there with Christ's baptism? This is why I said this is where he sees the sign. This is Mount Moriah. Right? She ties Mount Moriah with this baptism. Amen? So line upon line, the sign parallels this baptism. I mean, we can see, right? The sign parallels midway. The sign points to midway. Right? The end. So, it says, Abraham had heard the question of his son, My father, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? The father answered, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for, the, for a burnt offering. And in the ram divinely provided in the place of Isaac, Abraham saw a what? A symbol of him who was to die for the... So in this here, we have to see a symbol of what God is going to do at midway. Amen? But it's a real thing. Was there a lamb there? Did Abraham have to sacrifice that, that ram? It's a real thing, right? So, yes, there is going to be sacrifices here at the sign. Now, how that manifests itself, the Lord will open that to us. The Holy Spirit, through Isaiah, taking up the illustration, prophesied of the Savior. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is an important um, characteristic of this lamb. He bears the iniquity of us all. It says, but, of the people, Israel, but the people of Israel had not understood the lesson. There's going to be a lot of people at the sign who don't understand what takes place here. Right? And so what does the Lord have, would have us do? To go and give the message to them. Right? Next quote. Early writings 153.4. John was not certain that it was the Savior who came to be baptized of him in Jordan. But God had promised him a what? A sign by which he should know the... By which he should know... We are going to get a sign, and we're going to know that the Lord had provided himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Right? Then it says that the sign was given as the what? As the heavenly dove rested upon Jesus. So in the time of Christ, the heavenly dove was the, was the sign. So when we come down and we parallel it to the bottom line, where we have the sign, it is the sign. Right? That, that's the only name we have for it. Right? It says, And the glory of God shone ab around about him. John reached forth his hand, pointing to Jesus with a what? Loud voice cried out, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Why did John do that? When something happens on earth, where is it also happening? What was the Father doing at the same time? Crying with a loud voice, Be, This is my Son. Right? Earth recognizes Him as the Lamb, but heaven recognizes Him as the, as the Son. Right? This is the, the divinity and humanity. This is Christ bridging the gap between us and the Father. So while there is a law being enacted in heaven, there's going to be a law enacted on this earth. Right? Now we have to, we have to see these things. 
this, this law, whatever it's going to be, we have to see it and know. And this is only pointing to here. Right? We have to see and know also that the, the, it's going to also tell us who is going to be, be sacrificed in some, some ways. Right? The ram caught in the thicket. Right? So, let's look at this heading called the counterfeit. Right? Now that we have all these things, um, and you come in here, it's behold the Lamb. It says, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And the Bible says, all the, and the iniquity of us all, sorry, the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us. So from this point forward, Christ is carrying our burdens. What are we supposed to do? Keep our garments? That's it, right? Christ is carrying our burden all the way because the Lord has found a ransom. Amen? Now let's look at this counterfeit. The Bible says the track of truth lies close beside the track of error. And both tracks may seem to one, may seem to be one to minds that are not what? Work by the. So what comes on at the baptism? The spirit. And if your mind is not worked by the spirit, what will you not see? You would not see that sign. Right? But would you think you've seen the sign? Yeah, because the track of truth and the track of error runs. So if Christ has a sign here, who else has a sign there? Satan is right here with a counterfeit sign. All right? Now let's go to Isaiah 14. We know it well. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakens the nation, weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend. I will exalt. I will what? Sit. All those things are things that Christ will do. All right, keep that in mind. All those things. And then it says um, in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So everything we see on this line that Christ is doing, who should we see counterfeiting as we go along? Satan should be right here counterfeiting this very work. All right? But there comes a time when he can't counterfeit no more and he has to do the actual work. The work that he was set out to do. Uh, that he set aside to do. Are we following? All right. Amen. Matthew chapter 3. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. fire. And we know we have two troubles. The first one, water. And the second one is the fire. And what does Satan say? I will what? I will be like the. So what is Satan going to do? He's going to bring water and fire. and fire. Right? So Revelation 12. The Bible says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out upon the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman, and to the woman was given wings of a great evil, eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time. From the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his, wa his mouth what? Water. water like a flood after the woman. So Satan in the first 1260 is doing this work of casting out what? Water. water right? He's counterfeiting this work. And Christ allows it because this water is our baptism. <laughs> right? Yes? Yes. He, he's counterfeit John. Alright? So... Last week, Canard, um, he showed us on the board that in the 1260, in the 1260, you see the work of the water and the work of the fire, right? In that, in 538, the 1260 began, right? And it ends in 1798. But there comes a point when the Jesuits go down. What year was that? 25 years before 1798. 1750, 1773, right? You have in 1773, the Jesuits go down, and that begins a little time of peace, and then the French Revolution comes up in 17, 1793, and now you have this, the second trouble, right? 
So I'm putting it to us that these two troubles, 538 to 7073, that's just the water. And 7093 to 7098 is the fire. Right? Satan is counterfeiting God's work. Amen? So let's look at the fire. Revelation 11 and verse 7, it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, or when they are finishing, right, what point does that take us to? 1773, right? When they are finishing the testimony, the beast that ascended up uh, out of the bottomless pit, which we know parallels mi the midnight cry, uh, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and what? And kill them. All right? Now let's go to verse 5 of the same chapter. If any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth. mouth. So how does the, 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 how does the two, witnesses, two witnesses retaliate? It's fire. It says, and if any man will hurt them, he must in the same manner be. So why, how, verse, verse 7 says, the two witnesses were killed. And verse 5 says, the same way they kill you is the way you kill. So what came, what came out of the mouth of the beast then? Because the two witnesses are bringing fire. From 7093 to 7098 is the fire. Right? So Satan is counterfeiting the work of Christ. First the water, then the, fire. then the fire. Right? But on a larger level, the 1260 is the water, and then at the end of the world, it's the, it's the fire. But again, in that, it's going to repeat the water and the fire. Are we following? All right, praise God. So Job 41 gives us um, some, some sure witnesses to show Satan is doing this work says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? In, in uh, Revelation 12, it's the dragon that's bringing the water. Amen? Amen. All right. Now Job says, Canst thou draw out Le Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Out of his mouth go goes what? Burning, Burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of the seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Isaiah 21 explains who Leviathan is. In, the day, in that day, the Lord will, with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish who? Leviathan, the what? The piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay whom? The dragon, right? That old serpent, the devil and... Satan. So Revelation 12, the dragon brings water, but here Isaiah is saying the dragon brings fire. Satan counterfeiting the work of Christ. Amen? Now, the water work for Christ was at the baptism of John, right? But the fire work was the baptism of the cross. As we know, the end here is October 22nd. It's the Passover, right? And there Christ is crucified on the cross. So if Satan is doing this water work and this fire work, what must happen to him? He must also be crucified. I will be like the most high. <laughs> well, let's just say he chose that cross. Christ, Christ says, um, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. And so we, we, we have to go to the cross regardless. Either we take up Christ's cross, or we ignore it, and then Christ puts us on this other cross. You follow? Yes, the wicked does destroy themselves. All right? So, now let's go to this last part. Now, in the very first quote, I didn't bring it down here. In the very first, no, sorry, the second quote, at the end of it, Sister White says, Never had heaven so great rejoicing as when the tabernacle of men of heaven was set up among men. men right so now let's just go uh, let's just take a brief uh, look at that Richard, what's the time okay it says in Ezekiel 37 and David my servant shall be king over them and they shall have one shepherd they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell where? Pointing us down to this end, right? They shall dwell in the land. 
that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I, I will place them and what? It's, it's not the same promise he gave to Abraham when Abraham was sacrificing Isaac. I will multiply thee as the as the stars, right? So I'm saying right here at the sign, the Lord makes with us a covenant of, of peace, right? Then he says, It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them for how long? Forevermore. If we accept the baptism of Christ, that sanctuary is with us forevermore. Right? But we just have to endure unto the Unto the end, right? Yes. The Red Sea. All right. Yes, and the fire at Mount Sinai, water and fire. Amen. Yes, in the in 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 Egypt. Mm -hmm. They went away from it, so the Lord had to redo the whole yeah. process. Teaching the Sabbath, amen. Amen. Verse 27 says, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my. You could trace this phrase, and it's really nice. And you get many, many understandings of what the Lord is going to do to set up his tabernacle. Right? It says, and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do what? What, what does that bring in right there? Sabbath. The Sabbath. We went over that this morning, right, Michelle? Keep my Sabbath that they may know that I, the Lord, doeth sanctify, sanctify you. This covenant of peace is what? So what light should we be seeing coming at the sign? Light on the Sabbath. I mean, are we already seeing light on the Sabbath? Amen. Right? He's only going to confirm it. Right there at the covenant, right? At the sign. The Sabbath. All right. Yeah, the end. Yeah, it says, it says there, but um, the covenant is referring to what, too? Church? Whatever, what, whatever, the, whatever the tabernacle illustrates, you have to go find it and apply it. Because the tabernacle is you. Right? And the final review is God going to have a people perfect. So where is the tabernacle? With men. Right? But when Christ comes, he comes in with the holy city, and he's coming with his tabernacle. So where is the tabernacle? Christ himself is the tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle in 27 AD? So you have to take these varying stories and, and line upon line, put them in our time. So the light that we're going to receive here is going to typify, if we're faithful and we accept it, is going to typify the tabernacle of God being with men. Why? Because we're the only people on the planet that's going to be able to explain what's coming and what happened and where we are. You follow? So in this sense, the tabernacle of God is with, yeah. is with men. If men want the light, they know where to go. Right? Yes. So Revelation 21, which is what we said earlier, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That takes us all the way down to the end. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. I'm saying the sign is only a taste of that. Right? Because when Christ came at his baptism, was he with men? The word became flesh and dwelt 
among us, right? But you have to accept Christ. And, and he shows that because at the, when he resurrected, what did he do? He took men with him. Amen. So the tabernacle of God was with, was with men, right? All right. So let us, let us skip this verse and let us go on to Genesis 17. All right. This is the covenant that he makes with Abraham. It says, And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be thou what? Where does that place us? Right at the beginning. See my servant Job? He's perfect. All right? So right at the beginning, God coming to Abraham to do what? To make this covenant. Are we following? But in order to make this covenant, in order to sorry, to to, to confirm this covenant. You must go through this test that Abraham went through, the three days, right? And you come down to the third day, fifth day of the fourth month, and then he gives you the sign. But this is only pointing to, to the end. Are we following? All right. That's why Abraham was a sojourner, right? Because he knew that all these things were only pointing to, to the end. Verse 2 says, And I will make my covenant between thee, and will multiply thee how? exceedingly and Abraham fell on his just like jo, jo, um, just like Ezekiel just like Daniel just like John they all fall on their face right here at the fifth day of the fourth month and it says and God talked with him saying as for me behold my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations this is nice this covenant is exclusive only those of us who walk in this light will understand what's taking place. This, this is what it is. The covenant is only with a particular group of people. Right? It says, Neither shall thy name more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called what? How did the angel call out to him on, 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 on Mount Moriah? Abraham, Abraham. Right? Right here. He's calling out to his people only. Right? Verse 7. Or verse 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and, and thy seed after thee, in the generation for an everlasting covenant. In their generation for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed the what? The land wherein thou, where, wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be there. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And it says, and they shall be my people, and I will be there. Thank God. This is the fulfillment of the covenant that the Lord gives to Abraham at the beginning, prior to the fifth day of the fourth month. Right? Next quote. It's nice. It says, it was at what? Midnight, that God chose to what? From the fifth day of the fourth month. This is the way God chooses to deliver us. Amen? All right. Job down to the next bowl. It says, The graves were opened, and those who died in faith under what? Under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath, came forth from their dusty beds, glorified to hear what? The covenant of peace. Right? So when you take this now, and you lay it, uh, special resurrection at the beginning, General resurrection at the end. What you're seeing is, in some sense, the Lord has already, already beginning to give us the covenant of, of peace. The never-ending blessing is what it's called. Right? So it says um, that, God was, that God was to make with those who kept his. How does he know we keep, we keep his law? He's going to say, take thy son, thine only son, and sacrifice him. Right? Right here. This, at this point, the Lord is going to, from heaven, give us the covenant of peace. Amen? Right at the sign. Next quote. It says, The rainbow spun in the heavens with its arch of light is a token of the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. The what was a, was a token? Rainbow. Where do we see this rainbow? The flood, the water. Where else? Say again, Kenner. Revelation 10, amen, history. Ezekiel, 50 of the fourth month. 
This rainbow, it's right here. This token is already here. We just need to see it. Right? So it says, the everlasting covenant. All right, never mind. Continue on. And the rainbow encircling the throne on high is also a token. A what? A sign to God's children of his what? Covenant of peace. Right? And like Romario said, the rainbow, I don't have different colors, but I'll just... Do a little thing right here, All right? The rainbow happens when there's water, All right? But not only water. Let's read this quote. As the bow in the cloud results in the union of sunshine and shower, All right? So the bow of above God's throne represents the union of his mercy and his justice. To the sinful but repentant soul, God says, Live thou, I have found the what? So John, he said, behold the what? I have found a, a ransom. We, by faith, we have, to, man, we have to see that the Lord is bringing us to the point where he's going to show us that ransom. Right? And when he shows us, we have to rejoice. Not because men are going to be killed, but because God is with us. Right? And we have to lament for those who don't see the sword coming, right? So it's, it's sweet, but it's also, it's also bitter, right? So he says, As I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I should not be wroth, that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not what? Depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be. So if we repent from this moment on, from the sign onwards, the Lord's covenant of peace will never be removed. But we know that at the midnight cry, Satan is coming to do what? To deceive. To deceive, to tempt, to tell you that the covenant of peace is not upon you. Right? So the Lord is giving us these truths so that we can plant our feet upon a rock. And when we get to this point, we shall not be moved. Right? So, quickly, let's just run through this last part, the ransom. Bold part. It says, So Christ laid his royal robes and garbed himself with what? Humanity and offered sacrifice. sacrifice. Himself the priest, himself the... Now, at the baptism, Ellen White said that Christ wanted a witness that God accepted his humanity. Right? So right here, Christ comes down, himself the priest, himself the, the victim. This is important. Then it says, As the high priest, after performing the service in the holies of holies, came forth to the waiting congregation in his pontifical robes, so Christ will come how? The second time. Right? So his first coming here at the baptism points to this second coming at this baptism, the latter rain. Rain mixed with the sunshine. Rainbow at the beginning? You ever seen fire make a rainbow? Yes. Look into fire closely. And see the colors of the fire? Yes. Rainbow in the fire. Nothing, nothing new, right? So, yes, right? Amen. And what does he do to the metal? He cleans it, right? It's burning the dross. So, it says, Christ is the priest. Christ is the is the victim. Satan says, I will be like the what? Like the most high. So what is he trying to be? The priest. But what is he, doesn't he want to be? The victim. But what is going to happen? And he has to be the victim. Right? Yes, he has to be the victim. Amen. Yes. Amen. This is why he must go to the cross. This is what I was saying earlier. He must go, right? So I wouldn't really leave it because 16, but we know in that story is the day of atonement, right? No, no. Not that he doesn't understand. That he's rejected. Yes. He's rejected it. Yeah. No, no, no. He does understand. He has rejected it. You follow? 
All right, for instance, I say, Michelle, this road leads you to Chrisburg Drive. You look to um, Pulaski Pike, and you look down there, and you know for a certain that that's Pulaski Pike, but you say, you know what? Nah, that road doesn't lead to Pulaski Pike. Does it mean you don't understand? No. no, you've just rejected what I told you. Therefore, if you go that way, are you going to see Pulaski Pike? Yeah. Not really, right? Or uh, even... Well, I should say that different. If you go that way with that belief in your mind that that's not Pulaski Pike, are you going to reach Pulaski Pike? Yeah. yeah. Satan is going that way believing or uh, uh, having rejected that that's that way. But he's going to be that way anyway. Right? This is the whole point. So it's not that he doesn't understand. Because he does. All the wicked understands. No one dies without a proper understanding of the plan of salvation. Right? So... Now this last part, you go to Leviticus 16, and how many lambs does the vow? How many lambs does, does, does the high priest take? Two. One for the sin offering, and the other for the for the scapegoat. Yeah. Right? And lots of cast, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So the two of them come up there, and who, no, the, nobody really knows which one is for which. Right? But who chooses which? Say again? The father. The father decides who's the priest and who's the, the scapegoat. So Satan and Christ comes up to the father, right, at the end of the world. And then what does he do? He casts lots of who's going to be the what? No longer the lamb, right? But who's going to be the, the king? And who's going to be the scapegoat? Right? So the point that I'm making is this. When you get to the sign, the cry goes, Behold the Lamb of God, which what? Taketh away the sin of the world. Why? Because the Lord has found a ransom. Who is the ransom that he's found, Val? Satan. Right? He's found one to place your sins upon. Because I, as Abraham was about to kill Isaac, what did the angel do? stayed his hand right and so the the sins were placed on this ransom on this scapegoat when the tabernacle of god comes down at the end and god is with men what is he coming on to do the bible says he comes to execute judgment and it is at this point that all the sins christ comes out the sanctuary with his kingly robes well the last work as priest he does is by putting the sin on the scapegoat then he changes his garment comes down comes down to execute judgment, right? So it, it's, yes, Christ, Christ would not subject us to anything that he himself is not willing to do, right? So Christ comes, and on the cross, what does he do? Himself the priest, himself the, the victim, right? So he takes on all, for, at the baptism, what does he say? He took on the sin of, of the world, pointing down to him dying on the cross, but at the same time, him dying on the cross points to the time when all that sins will be put on, on Satan. Christ is the scapegoat which the type represents. He's not the scapegoat. But he does teach you how it, the scapegoat is going to be dealt with. We follow? All right. So it's my prayer that this was clear. And by God's grace, we could receive much more light on these things. We can see clearly that the, whatever God is doing between the fifth day of the fourth month and the sign, it is important for us. Because as we accept, or uh, as we go to the sacrifice, we know by faith that God is going to hold the hand of the slayer. And in some sense, who's the slayer at the sign? Who's coming to slay us? Satan. And God is going to hold back his hand. Right? Giving us the opportunity to stand firm on his promises all the way into the land. So what the Bible is showing is each one of these stories in the Bible, every line in the Bible shows Christ, but it also shows Satan. Right? The track of truth and the track of error runs how? Side by side, close. Right? The only difference is we have to see is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what, Val? Every word. And what does Satan do to the scriptures? He either adds or he removes. Therefore, it's, not, it's no longer every word. Right? 
So the Lord wants us to see the way we detect Satan is by when he changes God's word to suit him. Right? And that's why we could see in every scripture, you could see Christ, but you could see Satan right along counterfeiting that work of Christ. So, um, praise God for the light that he's giving us. And may we all continue to, to study and stand firm on this platform. Uh, for it is, by, is the only way by which we can be safe. Amen. Let us kneel for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Holy Sabbath day and for the truths that you've uh, opened up to us. We pray and ask, Lord, that these, these things will produce work in us, Lord, transforming us, uh, teaching us how to walk as Christ walked, teaching us how to surrender and to, to pick up our cross and to follow him, Lord. As you show us the end, uh, we pray and ask, oh Lord, that faith may take hold of us, helping us to, to hold fast to the cords that you've let down. Lord, when there is, no, uh, when there is no, no ground underneath our feet. And Lord, we, forget, we ask for forgiveness for the times in which we are slothful, in which, Lord, we had, we had let go of the cord. And we pray and ask, oh Lord, that you're creating us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us. Bless us as we continue throughout the rest of the Sabbath day. Bless those who are watching as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.